I'm Summer May Finlay. We're at the Lowitcher Conference here in Melbourne. I'm a Yorta Yorta woman and I'm sitting with Professor Karina Walters. Hi, I'm Karina Walters. I'm enrolled in the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. I co-direct the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute and I'm really pleased to be here at Lowitcher for the conference. Can you tell us a little bit about the work you do? So you were talking this morning about historical trauma and also this afternoon about historical trauma and intergenerational trauma. Yeah, I do some work, um, uh, we do research on historical trauma um, and um, really looking at the impact of traumatic events on our health and well-being um, and we've since been moving into a direction of developing, uh, transcending the trauma, trying to develop interventions that um, help our communities uh, go beyond the, the confines of historical trauma. Can you just tell us the difference between historical trauma and intergenerational trauma? Because in Australia we use a lot of intergenerational trauma, but I think we're less familiar with historical trauma. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, historical trauma and intergenerational trauma are related, but they're different. Uh, intergenerational trauma could be these big tra traumatic events like flooding of traditional homelands that's caused by the weather, um, earthquakes, things like that, that cause a lot of upheaval and it, it certainly can cause trauma that persists for generations. Um, that's really different than historical trauma. When we talk about historical trauma, what we mean are these man-made events that target particular communities with the intention of uh, committing genocide, you know, annihilating people, or committing ethnocide, which the UN would consider, the United Nations would consider a form of genocide, um, uh, destruction of culture, like ways, things like that, uh, and epistemocide, which would be the destruction of traditional knowledges uh, or the appropriation of those knowledges for purposes other than the intended. And you talked this morning about things being talked about as cultural um, when they actually weren't part of our cultural practices. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, you, you and I were just talking yeah. a few minutes ago about um, how alcohol has been attributed to our indigenous communities, both here in Australia and back home, as being like, you know, the, the drunken Indian stereotype for us, or the idea that somehow it's cultural for us to, to um, be addicted to alcohol. We've even seen crazy articles um, from anthropologists and others written in, in the States in the past about the reason why we might like alcohol more is because we have this, this Kind of romantic idea of being connected to the spirit world and so you know it's besides being just inherently a racist <laughs> ideology and idea about it but um you know sometimes our communities we can internalize those messages and we think well but what, is that who we are and, and the reality is for example in the united states you know alcohol was actually introduced by the federal government benjamin franklin said the best way to kill indians is by the means of rum so that was actually, he said that in the congressional floor um, as a policy to, to, uh, uh, to enact against indigenous people. So um, alcohol is not traditional to us in that way um, and, um, and it's been used as a way to uh, uh, navigate our treaty rights and other kinds of things. So, um, so it's good for us to think about not uh, challenging sometimes these assumptions in our communities that we take up from the dominant discourse that ends up being, you know, not really what our original instructions were. Our original instructions were go get drunk. <laughs> <You know? laughs> our original instructions were to uh, be careful with medicines because medicines can have two faces and if you don't respect medicines, they can disrespect you. So. It's funny you said that. When you actually said that, my mom always used to say to me, I'm giving you medicine, but it also is poison. Yeah, it there kills you the go. good germs as well as the bad germs. You need to be careful. Right. So, yeah, when you said that I had my mum sitting there yeah. telling the same thing when I was about this high. Right. So our teachings, our, our, our indigenous knowledges um, tell us how to, to handle those situations in, in healthful ways. It's colonization that tries to sell a different story. Absolutely. It's the adoption of, of the narratives around what it means to be indigenous. That, yeah. um, one of the other things that you spoke about as well was truth and reconciliation and some of, some of the challenges around that as well and, mm. and ways forward. Mm -hmm. Well, I think for the truth and reconciliation process, um, we have a long ways to go still in the United States. Um, still you know, yeah, we, we, you know, we have a hard time apologizing and, uh, or acknowledging some of these events as being even traumatic, much less um, taking some the steps to really talk about them and, and moving forward. Um, so I do hope that we're able to do that eventually. At the same time, one thing I'd like to point out is uh, I, I think part of 
colonization is for us to create systems of dependency, and so sometimes we think if we've been socializing the system for a really long time, that the answer is going to come from these policies or from these things outside of ourselves, when in fact it's really going to ultimately come from ourselves and our communities to move forward in a way. Um, we need to go through that process for reconciliation. So, so having a policy come in place will be a step forward, but it's not the antidote. It's really, it's really going to be the healing. It's going to have to come forward from both of our communities stepping forward. And you know, it's it's helpful. It's good that you know the dominant culture says, hey, you know, we apologize, we recognize we've done this. It's been bad, but that's just the beginning of the conversation and the beginning of the healing. Yeah, it's, it's interesting when you talk about policy because there is a, a state in, in Australia that is looking at adopting um, what's a, a regional authority. So again, it's a, an Indigenous government st structure and actually making it, legislating it so all the other state, all the other countries within their state must adopt this mm, government structure. And it's kind of like, well, let's work for one country because they're developed yeah. for themselves. Right. But when you take it on board, it's, yeah. yeah where to draw the line between the coloniser taking and adopting and basically bastardising, sorry, yeah, yeah. bastardising something yeah. that is cultural. Right, right. And what we don't want is to someone to pat themselves on the back and say, oh, so we've done our work, we're yeah. good now, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, the reality is the, the systems that perpetuate deprivation of, uh, and, of culture and community and, and other kinds of things, that actually are structures that have to change. And so. This is a step forward. It would be important. I'm actually supportive of being able to start to speak the truth and, and, and talk about that. I shared as the Chakas, the, actually it's a Natchez Southeastern story about um, the importance of um, uh, speaking truth to power and how that, that is healing in of itself. Um, but again, the structures have to shift and it's, you know, I agree, and it's funny, Chelsea Bond, who I don't know if you've seen her speak or her work, she's fantastic. She actually said today, though, that truth-telling does not make for a good career. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things no. where it definitely needs to be done, but it, it has a, you know, some people don't want to hear the, the truth. Speaking of truth and truth-telling, and you know, you said, you know, the US has a long way to go. What do you think of Trump, and will that undo all the good work, or will it, you know, yeah, I'm in mourning at the moment if that is indeed going to be the case. Um, I was hoping it was a practical joke that someone's playing on us. Yeah, no, I don't think it doesn't look good for, you know, it's so complicated. Even we have Indigenous people who've actually voted for Trump as well, and I honestly don't understand because it works directly against our best interests. He's been very clear in the past, um, uh, with very derogatory comments about deciding that various people, not just Elizabeth Warren, calling her Pocahontas, but also talking to other communities and saying that they don't look Indian or as if he's the expert. And um, that kind of language is damaging, not just because it's coming from an, a leader who's now potentially our president, um, but it's damaging because those kinds of comments really serve a purpose. They're not accidental. They serve a purpose to maintain status quo. And, um, you know, I'm not convinced that Maybe he'll get an advisory group and a panel that will properly inform him, but I'm not convinced that he understands, based on his prior comments, what the federal trust responsibility is and what our treaty rights truly are and what his responsibility is as President of the United States, if indeed that is going to be what he becomes, um, what his obligation is to Indigenous people and how to... Um, so I do fear that, um, you know, and also his investment in the... the energy transfer partners for Dakota Access Pipeline, you know, he's got, I think, a million dollars worth of stock in there. And so, you know, I don't know how we're going to undo some of the problems with, um, you know, issues around our sacred rights of uh, land and title and water title and all of this stuff um, with his presidency. And I'm, I'm praying and I'm hoping that, um, you know, there will be no damage, but, you know, not really confident in that. Yeah. We're all a little bit scared. Yeah. Anyway, I think we might let you go, get ready for the dinner. Thank we you. need to get spruced up, so thanks, guys. <laughs>